So it'll be great to um, have a wonderful dialogue about workforce development. So as you're joining in on the call, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dan Onofrio. I'm the president and CEO of the Bridgeport Regional Business Council and our affiliated chambers of the uh, Bridgeport, Stratford and Trumbull Chambers of Commerce. Again, uh, welcome this morning. Uh, we sincerely appreciate your time for this very important dialogue around workforce development, um, especially in the times that we've uh, uh, experienced over this last year. Um, so while people are joining in, if you can, um, just to test out the chat, you can certainly, uh, on the bottom of your screen, just enter in who you are, where you're from, um, why you're here, um, and uh, this way we can see who and who's joining us this morning. Um, I know we've had a, a quite a few of our uh, legislative uh, elected officials uh, joining us as well. I think uh, Senator Tony Wong from uh, Fairfield is is joining us. Uh, I know Mayor Ganim's office is on the call as well. Uh, so again, thank you for uh, for your time this morning. And I think uh, we'll give it another couple seconds here, and we'll we'll kick this off. <clears throat> Morning, Sarah. Always good to see you. <clears throat> Fairfield University is in the house. Very good. My good buddy, Joe DeStefano. Good morning. Paul Mayer from the Shed Group. Morning, Francine. Pablo Cologne. Haven't, haven't seen you in a while. Good morning. <clears throat> and Gwen. Good morning, Gwen. This is right up your alley. <clears throat> Great, good to see all the universities here. Such an important part of this puzzle that we'll be talking about this morning with the uh, workforce development. <clears throat> okay, so I think we'll we'll get going here. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm Dan Onofrio, President and CEO of the uh, Bridgeport Regional Business Council and our affiliated chambers. Um, we're very excited to be hosting this series, uh, you know, especially in the time that we've we've been in this past year. Uh, in my conversations with businesses throughout the region, uh, we've been hearing the recurring theme of uh, you know difficulty in finding um, the talent to fill critical roles, and then with COVID and having people being displaced, um, there's this need for uh, uh, upskilling and reskilling. Um, so we thought it was vital to, to bring all the relative parties together in this first of three series um, around workforce development. We're excited to kick it off this morning um, in partnership with Fairfield County Community Foundation. And for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with um, Fairfield County Community Foundation, they're co-hosting this with us. Um, they are a trusted uh, nonprofit partner and thought leader uh, in Fairfield County uh, that brings together the community's organizers, business experts, philanthropists, uh, to close the opportunity gap here in Fairfield County with a focus on eliminating the disparities in education, employment, housing, and health with the goal of creating a vital and inclusive community where every individual has the opportunity to thrive. Um, so we're grateful to partner up with them. And, also, the Bank of America. Uh, shortly, I'll introduce uh, Carol Heller, who is the um, uh, Southern Connecticut Market Executive for Bank of America. And let me just tell you, when COVID first struck um, about a year ago, uh, Bank of America and Ca uh, Carol and I had a quick call just to catch up, because as you, most of you know, I'm relatively new in my role here too. And uh, they were really uh, guns a-blazing on this, on this workforce development. They uh, partnered with social venture partners. I know they've done a number of other things since then, um, but they right away recognized the need for, um, for uh, sort of CNAs and, and technicians that would be needed for uh, the vaccinations. And, and they partnered with Norwalk and Houston Community College to, to reskill uh, folks from the service sector, uh, hospitality sector that were being displaced um, due to COVID. Uh, so they have been a um, very focused on workforce development. Uh, we're grateful to have them as partners in the region here in Greater Bridgeport and throughout Connecticut for that matter. Uh, and we're grateful to have them um, sponsoring this event really uh, in this series, uh, again, this first of three series. And, and it's our hope that we um, bring together uh, not just those that are hiring managers, but those that uh, from the community that have been displaced or that are looking um, 
uh, for what their future career paths might hold. Uh, and ultimately, that is the uh, focus of today's session, um, is the career pathways. And um, with that, uh, we, we're looking forward to having this dialogue uh, this morning. And, um, uh, and I think we're about ready to get started here. So I'd love to introduce uh, Carol Heller, who will be introducing our keynote speaker this morning. Um, and again, Carol Heller is the uh, Southern Connecticut Market Executive for Bank of America. Uh, so good morning, Carol. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we look forward to kicking this thing off. Uh, and, and thanks again for your support so we can do these kind of things. Great, good morning and thank you, Dan. And on behalf of my colleagues at Bank of America, it's an honor to join our longstanding partners at BRBC and Fairfield County's Community Foundation in launching this new series of conversations focused on fostering uh, training pathways and connections to job opportunities and sustainable career pathways with employers in our region. Uh, at Bank of America, we see tremendous opportunity and are deeply committed to supporting local sector partnerships and training. Uh, two weeks ago, we announced an expanded $1.25 billion, that's $1.25 billion five-year commitment to advancing racial equality and economic opportunity for people and communities of color. Um, and that includes a focus on job training and reskilling. We've been proud to partner with the Governor's Workforce Council, as Dan mentioned, the state community college and college and university system, and community partner partners, including career resources, who I see here today, Scott, great to partner with you, um, in funding skills-based training collaborations throughout the region. We're energized by what we can accomplish together. I think that's the point of today's conversation and on our, our ongoing series of conversations. And look forward to continue to partner in addressing social and economic challenges facing our region. It's an honor to introduce our special guest, Kelly Marie uh, Valeris, uh, PhD, Vice Chair of the Governor's Workforce Council and Executive Director of the newly established Office of Workforce Strategy at the Department of Economic and Community Development. She is an owner of two manufacturing companies, Sound Manufacturing Inc and Monster Power Equipment, where she has served as president and CEO for 14 years before stepping down to take on her new role for the state of Connecticut. Dr. Valerie's earned her degree in educational leadership and adult learning from the, from the University of Connecticut, go UConn, in 2007. Kelly is also president emeritus of the Eastern Advanced Manufacturing Alliance and continues to serve on the board of directors of the Eastern Workforce Investment Board. She also serves on the Connecticut Department of Labor Apprenticeship Council, Department of Economic and Community Development Innovation Fund Advisory Committee, and is Emeritus Board Member of the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Kelly served as member of the statewide Advanced Manufacturing Advisory Committee for the state college and university system and worked with Three Rivers Community College to develop their precision sheet metal program and early college opportunity programs. Kelly is able to combine her roles in industry and education to develop leading curriculums and establish educational pathways and programs from secondary and post-secondary educational systems. This includes industry training and development that supports educators and development and implementation of pedagogy to improve problem solving, critical thinking, and essential employability skills to benefit students and the workforce pipeline. Thank you, Kelly, for all you're doing to help us navigate the current challenges and advancing our career opportunities in this region. Kelly? Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you for the nice introduction. And I also want to acknowledge um, the support of you and Bank of America to the Governor's Workforce Council. Um, their generosity enabled us to develop programming, accelerated program, programming for medical assistance and a really important um, a work, work um, occupation that is in high demand right now. And so we, we do appreciate your partnership there. I also want to recognize uh, Senator Tony Wan on this call today. He's a member of the Governor's Workforce Council Board and we thank him for being here today. Um, today, I really wanted to spend some time giving you a real high level overview of the Governor's Workforce 
for a strategic plan. Uh, many of you have uh, participated in the plan and are continuing to work with us as thought partners or rolling up your sleeves and really digging into the work of the governor's plan. Um, and then I wanna spend a little bit of time really focusing on what we're doing in response to the COVID pandemic. And as we know that the pandemic really hit our lowest skilled, youngest um, residents of Connecticut and nationally, and those who are have under skills and, and are uh, low skilled employees. The interesting thing that's happening in the economy right now as we're starting the recovery from COVID is that there's almost as many job openings as there are people who are unemployed. The problem is, is that we have a significant skills mismatch. So the role of um, that we're taking immediately is really helping to upskill and reskill people into those uh, entry level uh, careers that have upward mobility. So we'll spend a little bit of time today going through the, the plan and really the plan has enabled us to respond more quickly and efficiently uh, to COVID and being able to address these issues of getting people back to work quickly. Um, so if um, we could put the slide up, that would be great. Okay, we might not have the copy of the slide, that's okay, we can do without it. Um, so the Governor's Workforce Council is, strategic plan is broken up into four uh, sections. The first is business leadership. And this is really why it's so important for all of you to be here today as business leaders or parts of organizations that work with other business leaders. Business really has to be at the center of all of our workforce development conversations. In the end, they are customers. So we wanna make sure that they're involved in understanding what their needs are ensuring that we are building programs that meet those needs, not only of today, but have some flexibility in the program and always thinking forward. So we're keeping up with their needs as they change um, due to technologies or the changing um, needs of the economy. So in order to ensure that business is really involved in the work, we first have more than half of our council made up of C-level uh, business leaders from across the state of Connecticut, representing all the regions of Connecticut and the major industry sectors. So as we talk about industry sectors that are in demand now, we're looking at healthcare as being the largest industry within demand. More than 50% of the jobs that are open in Connecticut are in uh, healthcare. We're also looking at IT as being a really important driver of workforce development moving forward, especially with the fact that the pandemic has really changed the landscape of work. Um, prior to the pandemic, all of us today would be sitting together in a room having this meeting face-to-face. -face, and instead we're here online and able to save kind of that travel time in between meetings to be more effective in the work that we're doing. And there will be some component of this online virtual reality moving forward. And a lot of businesses are really looking at how effective it is to have people to show up in person to work every day. So there are companies who are saying our workforce is going to be remote moving forward. And others are saying there's going to be a hybrid. So the reality of how technology has changing the way we're working and not only working, but living because now with technology, we don't necessarily have to live where we work. And so jobs can be filled from people all across the country into some of these larger organizations through IT. So we have to make sure that we're keeping up with the changing demands of IT and that we're working with our educational partners, whether in the secondary schools, the post-secondary schools, our community college partners have been central and so important in, in developing programming that we need to make sure that we're building out IT programs that meet needs. And in, in this region, um, that's extremely important with the types of companies that are in Fairfield County and Stanford area. Um, we're also looking at um, emerging jobs in, in green energy. And we're working closely with Department of um, DEP to determine what those jobs are today and in the future and building out programming for that. And of course, manufacturing has always been center 
and we need to make sure that we continue uh, the great programs that are in uh, manufacturing. And I see, you know, Rich on the line here, um, and who has, you know, been dedicated to this work um, for a very long time. Rich and I have partnered on these conversations around the state. And that work is so important to continue to drive forward as we have an aging workforce in manufacturing and we have a whole change in, in kind of the industry with industry 4.0 and new technologies coming in. So that's a really important stream as well. So what we've been doing to ensure that businesses really are at the center and that we're having these ongoing conversations is we're building out next generation sector partnerships across the state. And we recognize that there's great partnerships that have already been established. And so this is not to undo or redo those partnerships, but it's really to enhance those conversations and enhance those partnerships. So in the Southwestern region, we have launched a manufacturing partnership and we are working on a IT business services type of a partnership moving forward. And I would just wanna spend a moment kind of explaining a bit about what these partnerships are, because I think the those of you who are on the call today, it's almost a call to action to get involved in your sector partnerships. So I like to talk about them in the way that we've designed a hub. And the hub is really around um, the workforce development boards, the AGC centers, the chambers of commerce, our educational partners, whether they're the community colleges, the high schools, the post, um, the universities, and other community organizations. And it's really important that we have this really strong stakeholder group come together and be that one place where you can all have meaningful conversations around how do we support the businesses that we develop these sector partnerships with. So as these partnerships are developed, the hubs will become stronger as more um, stakeholder groups join those hubs. And then the hub is actually the organization that decides which sector <clears throat> deserves our concerted effort moving forward. And so in, um, in this particular um, region, you've all decided manufacturing is the first hub and the second one is being built out. So I invite you all to really participate um, in these conversations and get involved um, within this group and in that hub who is already participating. So that's really important. The other thing that's important to business leadership is what we're calling skills-based hiring and understanding that not all people necessarily need a four-year or two-year credential and X number of years of work experience to fill a position. And that there's a lot of people that have the skills necessary to fill a role, but don't have maybe that educational credential. And skills-based hiring is really an opportunity to ensure equity and access to people who have been shut out or unable to participate in the ed post-secondary education system. And so it's really opening up the talent pool to people who could very well fill those positions. And so the next step is really getting um, a few pilot programs started with some organizations to rewrite your job descriptions and what you're looking for and be more closely matched to skills, which is really important with some of the next initiatives that we're doing in the education sector and building out these career pathway programs. So the goal in building out career pathway programs is ensuring that students have in high school the opportunity to engage in a pathway program in an industry that will provide them industry recognizable credentials, a dual enrollment or dual credit programs that stack up to community colleges and four-year organizations so that our students are not only career ready, but they're college ready. We have over 9,000 students a year that graduate without a post-secondary plan. And we wanna make sure that those students have the opportunity to engage in meaningful work when they complete high school. And the second part of that is to ensure that we have really strong sector-based training programs. And this is where um, people can earn industry recognized credentials, stacking credentials to get them in those skills-based uh, jobs. And then employers um, can improve, upskill them through incumbent worker training. 
So um, again, we're working very closely with the workforce boards, with Scott Wilderman and his team, with the community colleges, really are the central kind of components of the sector-based training programs. And we're really excited with all the federal funding that is coming down, that there's going to be more funding for sector-based training programs than we've ever had before. We also understand that there'll be additional funding coming down from the infrastructure plan and from the manufacturing plan that's being worked on um, by our federal delegations now. And also we understand that there's probably additional WIOA funding that's gonna be coming. So between all of these funding sources, there's really no reason why we can't ensure that every person who wants a um, meaningful sector-based training opportunity has that and has the ability to gain those industry recognizable credentials and stackable skills. So really important work being done in the education committees around that. And everything that we're doing is underpinned by the great importance of equity and access. So I've alluded to the, uh, to the fact that we need to make sure that our training programs are accessible to everyone. And so how do we do that? We need to ensure that we're widening the portal of people who know about these sector-based training programs and have the ability to register and get into that pipeline. Um, we need to ensure that our very valuable community organizations who provide a really rich, meaningful service to the uh, community members in their areas understand how to help their residents get connected to the AJC centers and Scott's programs um, in the workforce boards, because that's really the place in which we can get them moving into these sector-based training programs and um, ensure that they have these opportunities. The other thing that's really important with the level of funding that's coming down is we understand how vital it is to provide supportive services so that people are able to overcome the barriers of participation and get involved in these programs. And so we'll be providing funding for supportive services such as childcare, transportation, technology. We've worked with um, people on food security and housing security and ensuring that they're well supported and even earn stipends during the time that they're in these training programs. And now the next step is looking at with this additional funding is how can we further support people who take entry level programming and instead of ending support when the program is over and there may be a gap between the time where they uh, complete the program and get employed is how can we support them through that employment gap into employment and then help support incumbent worker training while they're there. So for example, CNAs is a great way for people to get into the nursing field, but there's a high turnover rate in CNAs and the pay is min typically minimum wage and it's very difficult work. So how can we work with our partners at the um, healthcare systems to ensure that they're supported through additional training to LPN and then even RNs? And so we're looking at how we can support that full spectrum of getting someone into the pipeline, getting assessed for what their interests and skill sets are, providing remedial um, education opportunities if necessary, getting them into those entry level positions and upskilling them and giving them some even supportive services while they're starting on the job so that they can save that money they need for a car or a down payment on an apartment or housing and those types of things. So equity and access is really important. And on the broader scale, we're working on um, childcare issues. We are really proud to be partnering with the Office of Early Childhood and with the Lieutenant Governor's uh, Council for Women and Girls on really how can businesses get involved with tackling the issues of childcare? Because childcare really um, is such a large issue that we're excluding really valuable members of our community from participating in uh, work because they have childcare, they can't um, afford childcare. 
Um, we're also looking at how we can improve the transportation barriers, benefits cliffs, and um, mental health and other um, special populations with regards to re-entry, veterans, opportunity youth, um, racial minorities, um, and those with um, disabilities. And so there's a lot of work happening there. And last but not least is work that's being done on data and ensuring that we collect data and use data for data-driven decision-making. And so we know that data is collected, but it's not always collected in a robust manner. It's not always collected in a standardized format across different uh, agencies and educational partners. So it's very difficult sometimes to pull that data together and really understand truly what our outcomes are. So we ensure that we're investing in the right places and that we are addressing any gaps in the system where people may fall out that we can provide additional supports for. So in a nutshell, that is the work of the Governor's Workforce Council and I really tried to focus on how that particularly pertains to the conversation of career pathways today. We do have our second quarterly meeting next Thursday, April 15th from 2.30 to 5. And I will put a link to uh, the meeting invitation in the chat before the end of our meeting today. And it's open to the public. And we really hope that all of you who are available can participate. We will be having breakout rooms where you'll have the opportunity to engage in conversations around each of those four um, strategic plan pillars. So I'm happy to take some questions. Great, that was great, Kelly. Thank, thanks so much. Um, and you know, from the BRBC perspective, you we're excited really to be part of the whole sector partnership conversation um, here in Southwest Connecticut, as well as our partners with the universities that are most of them are on the call in the community college. I know Rich Dupont from HCC has been a tremendous resource for us uh, in those dialogues and in those conversations. I just like to mention, you know, I, I did get the question a few times. You know, why do we choose manufacturing? And you hit on it when you mentioned, you know, we're trying to be smart about using data to make decisions. And, you know, people don't realize that, you know, the greater Bridgeport region still has, you know, 100 plus companies. I think it's like 170, actually, that are still in the region that are manufacturing based. And we have to uh, think about, um, you know, just how manufacturing is changing. And this sector partnership, I think, is really a great opportunity to help manufacturing evolve with our partners like Manufacture CT and, and universities and all the other folks uh, and the community colleges and, and to address those needs. And, you know, even if you take out Sikorsky from that equation, you know, we're still just pushing 25,000 jobs uh, for the region. So very, very critical. And I was ex excited to, to hear you say, um, you know, we're using data. And, and that's, that's been my response to people. Um, you know, without the data, it's very difficult to make um, decisions, but also as it relates to the sector partnerships, having these uh, the industry at the center of it all to help drive those decisions, right, is also critical. Um, so let me ask you a question. So how is it, uh, what's the best way for folks that want to get involved with the uh, Governor's Workforce Council? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if from an organizational perspective or from an individual perspective, what would you be your recommendation in terms of how someone might proceed around that? Sure, absolutely. So we are in the process of forming and launching a working committees for every one of the 19 individual strategic initiatives in the Governor's Workforce Council. So if you uh, take a look at the plan and I'll put a link to that in the chat as well, um, you can, there's one pagers of each of the different initiatives and the work that's being done. And we're happy to have participa participation either in a working group where you're meeting weekly, bi-weekly and really tackling the issues around those initiatives or to participate as a thought partner and an advisor to the group, which would be a um, month monthly or bi-monthly meeting to really get an understanding of the work that's happening in those groups. Um, right now, we have over 400 volunteers who are working either in a committee or as a thought partner and really excited about that because we get, you know, really rich conversations going there. And even, um, you know, some of those um, committees are even broken up into smaller subcommittees. So when we talk about sector-based training, each um, industry has a subcommittee under sector-based training. But really, a, another great place to get involved 
would be with your regional sector partnership because you're gonna be linked in directly to the work that the, this is happening at the Governor's Workforce Council. This is a place where there'll be local implementation of the initiatives that are in the uh, council are, are in the strategic plan. Excellent, thank you. And just as a point of reference, I did put in my contact information in the chat. For those of you who might want to be involved in the conversation around the sector partnership here in Southwest Connecticut. Um, so uh, you can just call me up or email me and I'll, I'll, I'll tap you in. In addition, you know, the Q&A uh, button is at the bottom. If you have questions, feel free to, uh, to enter them there uh, or in the chat. I'll try to moderate both here. Um, but we did have a, a shout out to say, great that we're looking at childcare. Um, uh, you know, it's not just a women's issue, it's a family issue uh, and, and ultimately an economic issue, right? Um, so building on that, um, can you speak about the K through, through 12 initiatives, especially as it relates to STEM? I know you touched a little bit about uh, on that. So if you can expand on that at all, it'd be great. Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we really think that students need to understand um, and have career awareness from a very young age, right? So we go to school and we, we're learning about things, but we really need to be able to start connecting the things that kids are learning about to the real world early on. Kids really only understand what they see on a regular basis. So career opportunities that are limited to what their parents do, what their, um, their family members do and things like that and the occupations they see in their daily interaction in their environments. So we wanna make sure that we give them career awareness early and often. We're working to build out more robust student success plans that start in sixth grade where students really are starting to create a portfolio of the things that they're interested in um, and how they connect to the world and where their skills are. And then building out into the high school systems, um, really meaningful career pathway programs. And we have some schools that are doing a really amazing job at these already. Uh, Hamden High School is one of them in, in near your region. Um, and Wallingford High, and there, there's a bunch, Derby, um, doing some really great work the, what we're trying to work on with the State Department of Ed is making that more of a standard and not a one-off. So those programs are really typically very labor intensive. You get a couple, you get a superintendent, a principal, some teachers who are really passionate about something and they work really hard to implement these programs. But what we also see sometimes is when a key person from those programs leaves, then the programs sometimes don't stand up the test of time beyond the people that started those programs. So we really want to institutionalize that process and ensure that all schools build out these career pathways that have those industry recognizable credentials. You now we're working on some legislation going through in uh, Senate Bill 881 around how we can improve opportunities for students, especially um, in Alliance districts to ensure that they can participate in high level um, classes and that they have access and ability to fill out FAFSA so that they can go to four-year institutions. We're also working on auto-admit um, processes for CSCU. So really ensuring that we have those um, industry pathways that are really connected to your region and what's important for your students there. Excellent. And I think I know the answer to the next question, uh, Kelly, but I'll, I'll let you answer it. Are we planning on uh, partnering up with the Connecticut technical schools like the Bullard Havens of the world and these work-based work, uh, learning programs? Um, I, uh, I'm sure you could expand on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a new member of the board of the SeaTech High School System and really been working closely with the board and Jeff Wibby. And you know, their pilot programming right now um, where they're opening up the SeaTech High Schools after school and they're busing kids from the comprehensive high schools to the to the CTEX so that they can utilize the labs and the instructors in the curriculum in the afternoons and get credit for that in their high school. So instead of trying to build out really expensive programming in all of the high schools across the state, we're really trying to look at what are the assets that we already have through the community colleges, through some of the um, other college systems and the um, comprehensive high school or the uh, CTEC high schools and utilizing those facilities. And then can we keep those facilities open after those high school students go home in the afternoon to ensure that we have opportunities for adult education in the evenings up to even 11 o'clock at night and say on Saturdays. So um, we are working very closely um, to ensure that we can do that. And that's really part of um, 
Superintendent Jeff Libby's long-term plan is to get all of them opened up. Excellent, thank you, Kelly. And I think um, Janine from the uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation will also expand on, on, on that as well as we get into the panelist section shortly. So we have one time for one more question here, which I'll ask in a moment. Um, but we will, if you have any other questions, feel free to message us. I, again, I put my contact information in the chat. We will get you answers to any of your questions. So if you happen to miss Kelly uh, in a moment, uh, just feel free to continue to ask the questions and we'll, we'll certainly circle around with the panelists and Kelly um, as we proceed and, and get answers to everyone and a follow-up uh, message to all the participants today. Um, in addition, you'll, you'll see a survey that we'll be putting out as well that's geared towards the hiring managers and employers, uh, just so we can continue the dialogue around this workforce uh, development conversation uh, as we proceed to the next, um, the next uh, part two uh, and three of the, of the series. Um, so with that, Kelly, I guess the last question here is, uh, what is Connecticut's plan to create partnerships with unions and trade organizations, uh, you know, to train plumbers, electricians, masons, welders, and uh, a follow-up to that is how will that new uh, infrastructure pl uh, plan impact our region? How, how does that impact our region? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently the Department of Labor has really strong um, programming and relationships with the trades unions. And they've been doing a great job in expanding and in, in, in supporting the needs of the unions. But as we start to get more infrastructure um, funding and, and monies coming in, um, we will be partnering with the Department of Labor and um, involving the, the trade unions to ensure that we can build out programming that, that meets their needs. The needs of the trades programming is a little bit different than the sector-based training programs that we have been working on and that they really have um, follow the apprenticeship model, which is, is absolutely vital, and that that related instruction is on time with regards to what they're learning in the field. So we're actually looking on taking that really valuable apprenticeship model and looking at ways in which we can expand that. So we've done a great job expanding apprenticeship into manufacturing, um, looking to do that in healthcare and IT and in some of the other um, areas that we're gonna be training on, but ensuring as well that as this funding comes through that we are supporting the educational needs of the trades. Excellent, thank you, Kelly. Okay, so that concludes our keynote uh, conversation with, with Kelly uh, Valeries from, uh, from the Office of Economic, I'm sorry, the Department of Economic and Community Development and the Office uh, of Workforce Strategy uh, in Connecticut. So thanks again, Kelly. That was a great uh, uh, kickoff to this, this series here. So we'll move right into the panel discussions. Um, and with that, I'd love to uh, introduce our partner um, from the Fairfield County Community Foundation, Janine Freeman who is the Director of Education Youth Development um, and has been an, a, an awesome resource for us as we've uh, created this program for you. Uh, and really a shout out to everyone at the Fairfield County Community Foundation uh, and, and our partners that you'll see here uh, with the panelists in a moment. Uh, it's really been a great time to, to, to collaborate with them and, and ultimately you know, trying to get this message out to the community, I think is you know, really, what we need to continue to, to uh, digest and, and figure out the best way, means to do that and, and hosting series like these, these conversations and making them available to not just employers, but again, those that are in need uh, are, are important because it is a very important dialogue and not just uh, as individuals, but as it relates to our economic vitality for the region. It's a critical, critical conversation. So with that, love to introduce Janine. Welcome Janine, good morning. Good morning, Dan, and thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here with you, with uh, Kelly, with all of the panelists who um, are, I think, wonderful uh, examples of how we can make this work happen, um, the way that we can approach workforce development and think about how we can prepare um, our uh, communities for the new opportunities that may uh, become available. And as Dan said, um, I am the Director of Education and Youth Development with Fairfield County's Community Foundation, and this conversation is so critically important to the work that we are trying to do around closing the opportunity gap. Um, in particular for my portfolio, uh, the education and youth development work, um, this is 
a large part of what our focus is in terms of closing the opportunity gap and ensuring that um, our students in Fairfield County are able to graduate with um, the ability to um, the ability to pursue post-secondary education, go on to college, and also be career ready. Um, we pride ourselves on funding organizations that are trying to expand opportunities for youth and young adults between the ages of 16 to 25, um, that they are providing supports to do career exploration, um, to identify training opportunities that ultimately lead to credentials that put young people and young adults on the path for economic uh, independence and mobility. Um, because I think what is critically important here is not just getting people jobs, but getting people into good jobs that they are then able to sustain their families and really build and become eco economically upwardly mobile. Um, and so before I introduce our expert panel, um, I want to take just a couple of minutes to introduce Nola Shelley, who is um, a program participant and um, of career resources programming. And I think that she has gone through their training programs um, and is a graduate of the Youth Career Advancement Program, one of the programs that you will hear more about. And she's currently doing a virtual internship program with a child care agency um, and is going to share her experience with us. I think that it's going to be really um, important to hear from Nola and to be able to connect the dots with the conversation that will follow with the panel. So Nola, I'm going to turn things over to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your experience. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Nola. I am a recent graduate of the Youth Career Advancement Program. Um, and I am now doing an internship with a daycare center online where I am their media specialist. But during my time in the program, I learned a lot that I didn't know and have learned a lot of new skills that I have found very valuable going into the workforce after graduating this class. Um, <laughs> I have also made like many new friendships through this class that I have maintained outside and the skills I've learned in this class and the teachers, I, I will never forget that I had such a great time with this class. It's definitely something I would recommend in working with VRS and Career Hub and all those organizations together. And Nola, can you tell us a little bit specifically about the types of skills that you have learned and acquired and how you're applying them to the current uh, internship that you are participating in? So some of the current skills I'm applying that I learned in this class would be like a lot of Microsoft skills and research skills to so have to find links and um, apply them to social media and figure out a way to write that and post it um, on their public Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media I need to be posting it to. That is fantastic. And what do you what do you look forward to doing with these skills and and everything else that you're learning in your current program? How are you looking to apply them in the future? Um, in the future, I'm really hoping to get a job, maybe working with animals and just building up my communication skills and bonding skills and just other skills like that where I have to be hands on, like physically hands on with either people or animals or whatever it may be. Well, we really thank you for joining us this morning um, and demonstrating how when these programs work, they can lead to um, to skills acquirement or acquisition and um, and the ability to build on the skill sets that you 
had before, that you're currently learning, um, and that it's really gonna position you for the next opportunity. So we thank you so very much for, um, for sharing your story with us. And, um, and we wish you the best of luck with the rest of the internship and in the next um, opportunity that comes your way. Thank you. And now with that, I am gonna turn to um, our expert panel. Um, and I will introduce them briefly and then ask them to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about the work they're currently doing. So the first is a Victor Fuda, who is the director of the Southwest region at the Connecticut Department of Labor. We have Rich DuPont, the director of community and campus relations at Housatonic Community College, and he oversees the Advanced Manufacturing Tech Center. Uh, Nessa Leon, who is the vice president of operations with the workplace. And last but certainly not least, Scott Wilderman, who is the executive director of Career Resources. And I just wanna thank all of you for being here. The foundation has a longstanding history with all of your organizations um, and we support your work. And so I'm really pleased that you are joining me and I am looking forward to this conversation. Um, and just in terms of the audience, please, please add your questions to um, the Q&A function or in the chat. Um, I will be monitoring both of those as we um, proceed with our conversation. And if there's anything that comes to mind, please send it our way. So um, let's start with Victor. Um, please tell us a little bit more about your work. Good morning. At first, I want to thank Bridgeport Regional Business Council, the Fairfield County uh, Foundation, the Bank of America for hosting and uh, sponsoring this event. Um, and thanks for inviting us to participate in this first series of panel discussions. And Kelly, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful overview of the plan and your commitment to workforce development. And, and I can't say enough for Nola, uh, terrific job. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Again, echo best of your future and, and growing uh, and moving forward to achieving your, your dreams. Thank you. Um, I am the director of the Connecticut Department of Labor covering the Southwest region, uh, providing reemployment services to our American Job Center customers, uh, delivery of employment services eligibility assessment programs to, to customers who are receiving unemployment compensation benefits, uh, delivery of our Trade Act program, uh, which is for trade impacted customers, uh, veteran services, as well as business services. So thank you again for inviting. Thank you. And next we'll go with Rich. Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Victor, I'm, I'm going to ditto um, and echo everything that you said about, uh, you know, all those involved in this. It's, I think it's, it's wonderful to, to be able to demonstrate the level of collaborative that we have going on around the state. Um, and Kelly, it's your leadership. Uh, that is driving that. And um, you, you said so, so much about all that we have going on. But for us at Housatonic Community College, um, we are engaged at many different levels. When we look at workforce development, um, there are immediate needs, there are short-term needs, there are long-term needs. And some of the programs uh, that, that Kelly had referred to um, are, are within our wheelhouse. So. Uh, when we look at the, the Community College Advanced Manufacturing Technology Center, we're seeing people that come from all walks of life looking for opportunities um, in manufacturing as they see manufacturing offers not just a job, but a, but a genuine career path that pays um, not a, um, you know, a minimum wage, um, not even a livable wage, a gainful wage with plenty of room uh, for advancement and opportunity. And it's this partnership that we have with the workplace, with the Connecticut Department of Labor, with Career Resources, and with uh, Fairfield County Community Foundation for wraparound services that help support those uh, who have challenges with barriers to, uh, to coming to the college that really make this a strong, strong team. We're proud to boast 100% placement, uh, eight years standing now, out of our, our certificate program. Um, our College Connections program is, is very, very important to the process as well. Um, the certificate kind of serves some immediate need, 
our non-credit serves some immediate need, but our College Connections program is introducing high school uh, students at, their, at the junior level um, with an opportunity to dual enroll in a four credit program um, with our Advanced Manufacturing Technology Center. Derby High School is where we have a satellite center, but there are many high schools in the Derby, Stratford, uh, and surrounding areas that we're also working with and, and probably have uh, nearly 60 high school students enrolled in our certificate program. Each and every one of these programs provide pathways, pathways to employment, pathways to apprenticeship, pathways to continuing education, which could be an associate degree, could be a bachelor's degree, um, could be a, a postgrad degree someday. But the point is, uh, these are the people in our community. These are the people who represent our future. And it's incumbent upon us to be sure we're there to support everything that it is they're asking for as leaders in our community. And um, at Housatonic Community College, we're very, very proud to be partners in that process. And uh, I thank you very much for being a part of this panel today. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Nestor. Good morning. I echo my, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning. Echo my colleague's sentiment on uh, the kudos to BRBC, Cali, Bank of America, and to uh, NOLA. Uh, as the Regional Workforce Board, we really strive to make sure that we have got a full level of uh, partnerships. And, you know, as Rich discussed, and I think uh, Kelly stated in her opening, it, it's a call to action. There are multitudes of programs and access points that individuals, employers, and the community should be engaging in the workforce development system. I know we may have an opportunity to go into some of these a little deeper. Um, I see Sarah Lewis is on. Uh, we have uh, Apprenticeship Works, which is a great program right now that will assist individuals in getting into some of these manufacturing apprenticeship programs. Um, NOLA is actually a product of our WIOA Youth Career Hub program that is um, coordinated and funded through a request for proposal by Career Resources. So I guess my request is that this conversation is a great start, but we need to keep this conversation ongoing and you need to connect with all of us so that we can then develop that next step. Thank you. Beautifully said. Um, and Scott, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, Th thank you, Janine. And uh, as everyone else said, I, you know, I want to congratulate uh, Dan for having the uh, the foresight to actually bring this panel together and kind of talk about workforce development and uh, the happenings here in our region. And again, as everyone uh, noted, uh, especially Nola, you, you're doing a phenomenal job. Keep it up. We're glad that you've actually chose us, and uh, we're going to support you all the way through that career. Um, uh, Career Resources operates the American Job Center in this region. Uh, we also offer a, a variety of other resources to the community, uh, everything from uh, financial literacy to uh, soft skills training uh, to computer skills training. Uh, some of our other programs you may not be familiar with is that we coordinate with uh, the adult education programs to provide GED and ESL programming uh, for our clients. Uh, but more importantly, we're a resource to the business community. And uh, for those businesses out there today uh, that need to hire and skill up, I mean, we have the ability to come out there to help you do recruiting, uh, screening uh, for candidates, or even uh, we have a mobile career center. And if you haven't, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, we can definitely bring it to your facility. It, it has uh, computer stations on it, and uh, we can do a variety of uh, different resources, skills training, uh, you know, for your employees, for your, those incumbent workers. Um, the key thing to keep in mind, this is an exciting time in workforce development. Uh, there's a lot of funding available at a federal level, at a state level. We have a local plan. We have a state plan. So um, I think once we align all these resources, uh, we, uh, the future really is ours. And uh, so we're glad to be here today and answer any questions that you may have. Fantastic. And I think with that, um, I wanna do a little level setting um, because there may be people who are listening in on this conversation who don't necessarily know what we mean by career pathways um, and opportunities. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about that, what that looks like, what it means and how you all are approaching that. So Nestor, do you wanna start us off or? Oh, absolutely. So for us, a career pathway is really 
developing a, a plan with an individual. Oftentimes the job seekers um, have a very myopic view of what their opportunities are. And often that happens because of environmental factors or just you know lack of exposure. So what we wanna do from a regional standpoint is making sure that we are giving these job seekers the opportunity to align their current skill sets with what the market is seeking. So these career pathway programs do a dual role. They combine education with workforce development services at the same time that they're learning actual skills and services from an employer. So what we're doing is we're really meeting the demands and the needs for our employers. I could cite some examples. Uh, we have a youth build initiative right now that is a pre-construction uh, training program that uh, partners with um, Habitat for Humanity. And that includes educational advancement services, um, skill upgrades in terms of credentialing and, and a work experience program. Um, our summer earn and learn program, the application is out now um, on our website, www.workplace.org. That is a seven week career exploration program. What that really does is it lets at-risk youth between the ages of 16 and 24 actually experience work in those particular sectors. So if I had an interest in finance, I would be placed in, in, in a financial institution. If at the end of that seven week period, it was determined that I no longer want to have a, a, a career in finance, then we redo labor market information. But if it's determined that they want to be in finance, then we do labor market information to make sure that they understand what that career pathway is for them to be successful. And just to kind of add to, uh, to Nestor's uh, information, um, like through our American Job Centers, um, although as we all know, during this pandemic, our American Job Centers have been closed to walk-in services, uh, but we have been delivering services uh, online and, and virtually. Uh, so, and through, through our American Job Centers is where what we want to connect our job seekers, individuals looking for career opportunities, uh, career uh, changes in careers, uh, um, any other training opportunities that might be available. You want to connect them to these resources. Uh, and um, by doing so, I know we have a number of career counselors on staff. Uh, where we can meet with individuals who may be dislocated workers. You know, maybe they, they were impacted by a, a closing uh, and now they need to reskill or retrain or have that new, new career opportunity. Or individual, new individuals, youth, uh, looking for some guidance in terms of what type of career interests me the most and what do I want to, you know, look into where the occupations in demand kind of match that up. So our career counselors, can sit down and, and help you pave that way or map that, that path out for you and connect you to these other training opportunities that our partners uh, um, uh, have and um, enroll them into those opportunities. And I think Kelly had mentioned it in the beginning too. The biggest key about all this is our, our business leaders, our, our, the employers on this, because we need to make sure uh, we listen to uh, what they need and, and uh, modify or work our, our, our training programs to meet their needs. Um, so we really need to um, focus on creating this uh, through the center uh, and the center being our customer, customer being our employer uh, business uh, and our job seeker as well. Victor, I think you raise a really important point too, and, and to try and put a little bit more of this together. Um, first of all, our programs are driven by industry. It's the industry input uh, that allows us to develop the programs that result in this 100% placement. And, and these are people who, who don't leave manufacturing once they graduate. Uh, we know that they're staying in manufacturing and advancing. Uh, and the pathways are, are a very interesting thing, but you know, um, once someone comes through the Department of Labor and, and, and maybe um, starts there uh, either through career resources as a re-entry or returning citizen uh, or a WIOA eligible person um, or, or a dislocated worker and they select uh, the Advanced Manufacturing uh, Technology Program, uh, we're, we're very quick to point out that don't assume because you pick this pathway 
uh, you're going to be a machine operator, a very high paid machine operator, but not just a machine operator. Our, our students and our graduates are moving from machine operation to technicians, to programmers, to pre-engineering students and other programs, to quality assurance managers, to production managers, on and on and on. So these career pathways, if you will, are, are, are almost unlimited because the diversity of employment and career opportunities within the manufacturing sector are unlimited. And so it really does make a, a great choice uh, for those who have the aptitude or interest uh, in advanced manufacturing to follow. And again, cannot stress how important it is for the collaborative that we have in making sure people um, of, of, of all uh, interests are, are aware of what this opportunity is. They are our future. And Janine, if I could just add too, real quick, is that you know the main one of the main goals of the Career Pathways is also to create sustainable living wages. You know, this is a we we want to lift people out not only out of poverty but actually give them an opportunity at the American dream. And one way you can do this is providing these strong career pathways and stackable credentials. Um, and, and again, um, you know, uh, through this pan, uh, through this pandemic, uh, what we have seen is is uh, a large amount of typically low wage workers that were really impacted by this pandemic. I, it, uh, Joe Carbone from The Workplace has a phenomenal presentation that he gives. And um, at some point, you, uh, Dan, you, you need to bring him on here to talk about it. But I think 60% uh, of those currently unemployed were making under $35,000 a year and typically are women. So it, it has in it, this, this pandemic has really impacted uh, the low wage worker. So our goal is, the, is is to raise these wages through 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 this skills training and to make sure that if there's a next downturn, that this group will not be impacted. And that is such a perfect segue to the next question that I wanted to ask, which was um, sort of taking some of the themes that I've heard thus far about listening to employers and um, and them being major uh, sort of constituents of all of yours, right? What are the gaps that you are hearing in terms of skills? Um, and how are you all preparing the participants that are in your programs for that next level and making sure that they are acquiring the right sets of skills in order to be, be prepared for the opportunities that, um, that arise? Um, I'll go ahead and start if you don't mind. I think one of the things that we've been talking with employers and it, and it's still, it's been a long, it's been an issue right along. Um, it's, it's the whole work readiness component for a lot of individuals. It's the soft skills. It's knowing how to show up to work on time. It's knowing how to deal, uh, you know, with issues on the job and working with coworkers. Uh, it's a lot of the, you know, I would tell you it's the, it's the intangibles. So, you know, a lot of times employers will often say, give me someone that'll show up to work on time with the right attitude and I can do the rest, you know? And, um, and so I think one of the things we're trying to do is through a lot of our programs, uh, through our, our Strive program is one of those initiatives where we can offer some of those soft skills. Um, I know that uh, Nestor will probably talk a little bit about P to E, but the platform to employment also focuses on soft, soft skills training for the long-term unemployed. Um, but again, I, I, we see the soft skills as one of those areas that is a deficit. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, the soft skills are, are, are that initial barrier. Um, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were seeing, you know, um, relatively low numbers of unemployment and we were seeing employers willing to, to engage um, at, at, at new levels, uh, you know, during this pandemic. Uh, what we're finding is that a lot of those support systems for those individuals um, have been fractured. And uh, we know that, you know, prolonged periods of unemployment create um, additional barriers for individuals to engage and, and to fully engage in workforce development. So in terms of the gaps, there's, there's, there's that soft skill gap, but then there's that, then, then there's that technical skill that, um, you know, we can get some people into some entry level positions uh, without some of those certifications and credentials, but to get them to that career rather than that job, we've got to invest in their skill set so that they become viable. And that helps our end customer, as Victor stated, which is business. And the other thing that we I've heard too, 
from individuals is that the challenge is the experience, the work experience, right? So employers are seeking uh, individuals that have a certain level uh, of experience. So this is where, you know, apprenticeship comes into play, uh, uh, OJT, on-the-job type training, um, uh, some of these other uh, programs to expand apprenticeship into some of the other industries, occupations, I think will have a, a will increase the openings and the opportunities for individuals coming out with these tr these new certifications, trainings, degrees, uh, and give them a, a step basically into employment uh, where it would address that lack of experience. Victor, I, I think again another great point um, because one of the things that we work with industry on. Um, and, and I know that we're doing that in other areas outside of advanced manufacturing is to, to help them to understand that, you know, the, the, the person with all the skill sets uh, that you're looking for, unfortunately, is, is not available. And, and in these short term programs, whether they be a pipeline program for five weeks, seven weeks, 12 weeks, whether it be a four credit certificate program for 10 months, or whether it be a degree program for two years, we are not going to be able to create the level of expertise that you are looking for uh, in that short period of time. It is, however, um, a great opportunity to, again, build programs driven by industry that create pools of candidates who are excellent to train on the job, whether it be through an OJT program, an apprenticeship pathway or otherwise. That is the best that we can do. And that partnership with industry and in, in building that understanding is what drives what we have going on right now. So you started to talk a little bit about this, Rich. Um, and I'm wondering for each of you, how are you thinking about um, sort of building the support? And once you have identified some of the gaps in the structures that, you know, that, that people are working within, how are you um, sort of developing the programs and the supports for participants in your programs to ensure that you're meeting their needs, the needs of the employers and the needs of the community? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I, you know, I think in Southwest, we've indoctrinated a very holistic um, service delivery model where uh, the first thing that we wanna do is make sure that we've triaged you so that all of those um, you know, kind of Maslow's hierarchy, um, things have been checked off so that you can actually, you know, engage and fully participate. So, you know, if you have food insecurity, if um, your living situation is unstable, we want to mitigate those things with our partners before we put you into these training programs. But once you're in these training programs, these are not transactional relationships. So great, we put you in a training program, best of luck. We, we have a commitment to you. So we want to wrap the whole system around you. So we want to make sure that you're getting access. If you need technology during that time period, we've got laptops. We can help support with MiFi's on there. And at the same time, we want to keep that employer voice front and center. So what are they telling us that they need? So we put you in training for certification A. Now they're telling us they really want you to have certification A, and it would be great if you also had certification C. How are we building that into your life plan? So going to work is one of the objectives, but keeping you at work is the ultimate objective. So we've got a multitude of support services and deep partners to make sure, and, and we could talk about relative you know, examples of this, individuals that, you know, go through Housatonic's advanced manufacturing program that are co-enrolled in WIOA, receive additional case management, transportation, childcare offsets to make sure that these life things don't prevent them from engaging fully in these programs. Yeah, and Nestor, um, so just piggyback off of that a little bit, um, that is so important, uh, especially for many of our inner, inner city people who are, who are challenged with some of these barriers. Um, but who come in and then understand we have no interest in failure out of our programs. Everything is driven around success and leveraging on the wraparound services that will help them to succeed. And so when it comes to the one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps for somebody who may be a little bit concerned about being back in a learning environment or someone who may have a language barrier or someone who may feel they're weak in math, which is very important to what it is that we do, 
they receive the one-on-one -on -one service that they need within our programs or even with, with our partners around the programs to ensure that success. Now, for that, I think um, we're very pleased that the retention rate in our programs hovers just over 90%. And the completion rate is about 96%. And then the placement rate, again, at about 100% year after year after year. So again, can't say it enough times, the partnership is important to how we make this work. And again, I think you're, oh, Scott, were you gonna jump in? Uh, I, I was just gonna say, if you don't mind real quick. Jump in. Yeah. Um, you know, as you're talking about partnership too, I, you know, the biggest piece too is uh, the, we look at employers not as the end product, but as the front end, you know, oftentimes, you know, uh, you're, you, you, you brought up the point, Janine, how do you balance all this? You know, we have a business services team that works closely with kind of Department of Labor's business services team to really understand what employers are looking for and then meeting those needs of that employer, not just filling a job or a slot, but getting to understand their business and kind of what and, and what those emerging needs may be. And more importantly, if there's a challenge on, on, on the job or anything that does come up, as it will come up with any employee, that they have someone that they can reach out to to advocate on their behalf. Um, it's not a place and forget. You know, this is a long-term relationship. I think that that is, again, so critical to this entire framing the entire discussion. Um, and also, as, as you all have been talking, it is so very clear to me that there is a lot of collaboration happening. Um, and I think that people are probably not as aware um, of the fact that you all are working together and supporting one another um, you know, as much as you are. Can you talk about that and why that is so important to how the system works and how you all are having success with your program participants? Well, it, let me let me start if you don't mind. I mean, it really takes a village in this case. I mean, it's it's we're, we're we are working incredibly hard at bringing in so many community resources, not only to assist our clients, but to help employers as well as a community. Um, there's there's members that you may not even be aware of that are partners with our with our organizations. Uh, we work very closely with community action agencies, we uh, adult ed, uh, ESL providers, housing providers. Um, so there's, uh, wherever there is, you know, we try to kind of have the foresight to go look where there could be a potential issue and then kind of bringing them, bring those organizations collectively together uh, to discuss uh, best ways we can serve our constituents. We meet regularly with them all the time. And, and we also kind of come up with some best practice models. Uh, back in the, the, uh, the bricks and mortar day, uh, we actually have and still do, but it was a, a physical community resource center uh, where people could come in and they would basically meet with a person one on one that would help them from everything from housing to food to, to child care needs. Uh, all those were right there on site. Um, but we've expanded those relationships now to a virtual world. And um, I guess I'll let Nestor talk a little bit about that because I don't want to spend all the time chatting here. Nestor? <laughs> So I think you know the strength of our partnership is actually the the, the pillars that give us success. Um, we don't want to be um, stumbling and bumbling, and particularly with employers, you know, knocking on their door saying, you know, we're the workplace, we're the Connecticut Department of Labor, we're Career Resources, we're another program. We want this one voice model, and and also, you know, while while it can present that there's a lot of money available in the system, oftentimes some of these resources um, are very rigid. And they do only fit, you know, for certain populations. So the, the broader that we can connect all of those services, they may not qualify under one of the funding programs, but they may qualify under one of the partner funding programs. They can still get that individual into that training and into a successful model. So we've championed that. And it, and it runs all the way from supportive services to, to even our partnerships, you know, with, you know, with the chambers and other industry groups in making sure that we are streamlining access to these services. And rather than being pigeonholed and saying, um, no, it's got to be in this program, we all partner. And, and one of the tools that we also use uh, with the, within the American Job Center and the programs is our labor exchange system, case management system, which is CTS. 
Um, uh, within there, job seekers can view, you know, look for jobs, uh, create a virtual recruiter, resume. Employers can post jobs at no cost, uh, look at uh, resumes as well. And then, but also the AJC staff uh, within the programs also record their case management services. So as Nestor had mentioned about uh, not stepping on each other's toes in terms of you know, going in and meeting with an employer, this is where we record the activities and services. So someone could go in and look at, hey, someone that just recently visited, you know, uh, Fertile Stamp or some uh, other company and provided these services. Uh, so, so we kind of communicate and work together. The business services team is, is an important collaboration in our region. It uh, consists of uh, agencies, state agencies, organizations, and of course, the business leadership is key. The, the chambers, Bridgeport Regional Business Council is, is vital to us reaching the business community. Um, and so I think that's an important tool in all of this uh, as we continue to collaborate and work together. Thank you. And I'll just sum up the comments on our end by saying we are a community college and our community college is open to everyone in our community, whether they be a, a, a youth in a program, whether they be our adult learners, uh, returning citizens, veterans, uh, women, it doesn't matter. It, and, and we really strive to do that. And it's our industry partners who help um, to facilitate uh, that same message within our community because they need everyone. And so opportunities are, are endless right now. And um, uh, we think we, we are on for better days ahead for sure. I certainly hope so. And as someone that, you know, supports wholeheartedly programs that are trying to advance the interests of our youth and young adults who, um, who need a leg up and they need to ensure that they have the skills to put them on a path to independence. Um, how are you all doing outreach to young people? Um, and how are you ensuring that the ones who are the most vulnerable um, perhaps those who might be criminally justice involved or um, just have um, become disengaged and disconnected. How do we ensure that they have access to all of your programs and know where the supports and resources are um, to make sure that they get what they need? Yeah, unfortunately, there is no um, magic bullet that, you know, gets us, you know, connected to uh, youth today. Um, you know, they're very transient. Um, actually, in, in, in a focus group uh, very recently, um, we discovered that a very small percentage of them actually use email. Um, they want texting and they use social media platforms. So we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Um, we do uh, podcasts. Uh, we've had DJ nights, um, you know, where the focus hasn't been necessarily workforce development but it's getting them connected to our career counselors so that we can then find the appropriate times to have conversations about what your future could look like. Um, we do disseminate a lot of information to our partner and partner programs so that they can send that out um, to their constituents, but it really is a multi-pronged approach through uh, marketing, uh, social media, and um, direct partnership referrals. Um, I don't, Janine, I don't know if we can, but we might want to bring Nola back on and ask Nola how she heard about the program and how um, she got connected. Nola, do you? So I also work with BRS and my counselor had called me and told me that there was this class that was going to be, she didn't know when it was going to be, but she said it was going to be online. And she kind of briefly explained to me like what it was about, like what would happen and asked if I was interested. And I said, yeah, sure. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to explore this and increase my knowledge and get this internship. Th thank you, Nola. So and so then I applied. I was going to say too, if I, you know, uh, clients like NOLA, students like NOLA, sometimes are our best resource for recruiting uh, because they go out and talk to their friends and they, they have a good experience, hopefully. And, and as a result, uh, more, more uh, youth are turned on and brought into the projects. 
Yeah. Scott, that's a good point too. And we find that happens within our program. It's uh, successful graduates from the program are sharing with family and friends. Uh, and that's a part of it. But a couple of the other things that we're doing, and I, uh, Mester raises a good point. Uh, you know, the email is a, isn't always the best route, uh, but we're hosting um, virtual or on campus uh, open houses for students, potential students, uh, parents, guardians, um, and, and, and the general public uh, who might have an interest in our programs. And we find that that works well. Um, where I think we, we probably um, lack a little bit is in, in our advertising or our marketing of the opportunity. And I think statewide, we're recognizing that that's something that we need to do. Uh, we, know, we know from a couple of years back when we had funding that supported uh, an awareness campaign that enrollments and interest in these programs uh, was at an all-time high. And, um, and so that's something that we work on. And uh, we do that on a regular basis. So um, that's, that's what works for us. I know that we are coming to the end of our panel discussion. Um, and so maybe we could do a lightning round um, where you just answer, is there a program that we didn't talk about today that you want to make sure that the people listening know that you are conducting and how to get in touch with you? Yeah, I've got a couple. I mean, we've got, you know, Apprenticeship Works. Um, we've got a military to machinist program um, that we're seeking um, individuals for. And, you know, we are consistently recruiting for, you know, platform to employment and other programs. Um, my information will be in the chat and I'm always um, looking forward to engaging in conversation with you all. Thank you. Um, Vida, I will tell you right now, tax season, uh, they, extend, they extended it through mid-May. We're, we're a volunteer income tax assistance site. There are many others in the city. Um, if you're a low-income uh, family or no low-income family, by all means, uh, please refer them directly to, to, to Career Resources um, or the AJC. Uh, again, our contact information will be provided. Uh, just a, a quick note. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, wonderful data information on our, our labor market information website off of our, uh, um, our internet website page. So um, individuals interested in learn more about uh, occupations and demand, some of the sectors, um, uh, growth areas, uh, uh, help wanted online um, uh, uh, numbers, um, again, off of our website. Um, and any additional information that you'd like to tap in with our American Job Center services, please visit our website as well and click on the American Job Center. You can complete a request to either on uh, in-person appointment uh, or online virtual assistance. And for us at Housatana Community College, I would just offer um, to the audience and to your family, your friends, or anybody you think may be um, interested in what we do, never say never. Stay close, go far, that's our logo. And quite frankly, um, I'm very proud to be a part of everything that we do at Housatana Community College. Excellent. And I don't know, Scott, did you want to? Uh, I just mentioned the Vita site earlier. Um, that's, that's. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I was looking at the chat and I haven't seen anything, any other burning questions that people may have wanted to ask. So um, Dan, I will turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Janine. Uh, that was a great uh, moderated uh, panel. So thank you very much. And thank you again to the Fairfield County Community Foundation for uh, helping us put this program together. And, and thank you, a big shout out to our panelists. I know we work often and talk often on various topics, uh, but to Victor Fuda, who's also our, a Bridgeport Chamber of Commerce board member at the Department of Labor, uh, Nestor Leon from the Workplace, Scott Wilderman uh, from Career Resources, uh, his colleague Angela uh, is uh, running our uh, Leadership Greater Bridgeport program, is doing a bang up job there. And of course, Richard DuPont, who have Got to know quite a bit over the last several months, especially with the sector partnership stuff. So thank you for all you do at Housatana Community College. Uh, Nola, fantastic uh, story. Thanks so much for sharing that uh, with us. It, it goes to show you how 
uh, these programs can work and benefit people uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. Uh, and of course, uh, to Kelly Valeris um, uh, for her wonderful kickoff to this three-part series. Uh, thank you for your time uh, this morning. And uh, Bank of America and Car Carol Heller, who um, who made this all happen and, and given us the opportunity to bring this this uh, group of people together um, uh, for this very important dialogue. As we mentioned at the top of this thing, you know, work workforce development is a very broad topic, which is why we thought we'd break this up into three very valuable conversations. And I think the important thing here, um, as we prepare to wrap this up, um, is you know the conversation just shouldn't stop, right? We need to continue to talk about it. Um, and I, I envision that um, you know the BRBC and our chambers will continue to to put um, opportunities like this together, even beyond our three point uh, our three part series uh, over the next couple of months. And uh, you know, hopefully, we can re engage the conversation um, uh, in the fall and can just continue it and bringing the relevant resources together. I was following the chat a little bit, you know, and just seeing people interact with each other and. There's so many valuable resources and other organizations in the community that, as uh, Nestor pointed out, and a few others that you know require us to partner with, uh, and and uh, help solve some of the issues uh, like the soft skills training that we talked about a little bit. Uh, very important topic. Pam Lewis with Connect Us mentioned that you know how she's leveraging uh, improvisation, you know, and and. Uh, Mary Beth Nelson, who's uh, uh, on our BRBC board with uh, the work that she does at the right resources. So it's just good to see that there's all these resources out there. I think it's our job and our responsibility at the Business Council to bring all you folks together and get the word out to the community, uh, both on the business side and, and bridging that gap with the community, as I mentioned at the top of that. So let's wrap it up there. I thank everyone for, for your time. I do wanna ask those of you who have joined us online, you're gonna get a, a four question uh, pop-up when you, uh, as we exit here. If you could be so kind just to fill out that questionnaire for us, it'll help us make these events more efficient and more uh, topical for, for you and valuable for you. Um, and finally, as a follow-up, we will be doing a survey that we'll send out to all of our participants. Again, it's geared towards um, employers and, and, and those that are in a hiring position. Um, just to help us again get some valuable data so we can make better decisions on programming but also to identify the critical unmet needs that are exist out there um, as we talk about workforce development and then finally mark your calendar um, for the first week in may we're going to have the second part of this uh, very critical conversation um, uh, i believe either on the fourth or the fifth i think we're, we're getting geared up to to, to nail down that, that date so with that, I wish everyone a rest of a, a great, wonderful day here. Uh, it's 1030. We appreciate your time this morning with us, as always. And if there's any questions you have at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at the BRBC. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing you all again uh, very soon. Okay, thanks, everyone, for your time this morning. Thank you, Dan. Take care, all. Be, great day. Be, be well, everyone. Thank you.